I'm Andy Nidell, and I'm Pat from Sabaton, and this is Sabaton History. During World War II, Germany, like the Allies, tried to develop a nuclear weapon. And our song Saboteurs is about the people who prevented that. And it is also the name of our German fan club. So, what if the Nazis had developed the atomic bomb first? From the early 1930s, interest in atomic energy had grown dramatically. New research by men like British scientist Ernest Rutherford and James Chadwick had shown that by colliding an atom with a neutron, the atom could be broken down. And by bombarding unstable elements, a huge amount of energy was released during that breakdown process. The German chemists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann had further discovered that bombarding a uranium atom with a neutron would lead to fission, in which more neutrons were released. Those in turn would split more atoms, creating a chain reaction that would not only release an incredible amount of energy, but could even lead to the creation of new elements, a discovery that got Hahn a Nobel Prize. But as the Nazis steered Germany towards war, a new question arose. Could this new discovery be weaponized? Could this new energy be released in a bomb? By early 1940, the German scientists Kurt Diebner and Werner Heisenberg thought the answers were yes and yes. However, certain key components were needed to create such a bomb. One such key component in releasing the nuclear energy of atoms was heavy water. Let's get scientific for a minute, right? The core of this theoretic atom bomb would be plutonium surrounded by high explosives that would kickstart the atom splitting chain reaction. But the element plutonium does not occur naturally and must be artificially created in a reactor where neutrons bombard uranium to create it. This process was nearly impossible to control. So the scientists needed a moderator that would slow the neutrons down just enough to make it controllable. Such a moderator could be heavy water. Now, Heavy water had a longer reactivity than normal water because of the heavy isotope deuterium attached to the hydrogen atoms. This is naturally occurring in water, but only in a tiny, tiny frequency. But it can be artificially produced through electrolysis. One facility experienced in creating heavy water was the hydro plant Vimork in the Norwegian municipality Telemark. Vimork had produced power for a factory that created artificial fertilizer and had initially had heavy water as a byproduct, but over the years had recycled the heavy water, effectively enhancing its purity to over 99%. No one had really cared much about heavy water though, but as it became clear that it would be essential in the atomic fission process, its value suddenly increased enormously. Germany invaded Norway in 1940, but the heavy water reserves were smuggled out of Norway before the Germans reached the plant, though it would produce new heavy water, now for the German atomic effort. But the chief manager of the plant secretly kept British intelligence up to date about German plans. In fact, many Norwegians felt obliged to help a newly formed branch of the British government, the SOE. This was the Special Operations Executive, formed in July 1940. Its main task was to fight the German occupation in Western Europe through industrial and military sabotage. Specialists, elite soldiers, survivalists and secret agents would make contact with the occupied populations to find and recruit qualified volunteers to fight the Germans behind the lines. They would not just gather information, but actively kill and destroy German personnel and equipment, preventing Germany from developing an atomic bomb was on their to-do list. The production of heavy water took a lot of time and energy. To produce one pound took 25 tons of normal water and over 160,000 kilowatts of energy. And it also had to be refined to a usable purity. Still, in May 1942, Heisenberg met with the Reichskommissar for Norway and other officers to discuss how to proceed with the German nuclear program. Vimork was now producing 286 pounds a month, and most German scientists agreed that they could use nuclear energy to power industrial factories to produce weapons. 
but to actually weaponize it was not thought possible just yet. The military officers, though, were more interested in an immediate solution, not theoretical bombs that were maybe ready in months or even years. Heisenberg knew that they had something, but he could not figure out how to bring it to life. Though he secured further funding for the project and made plans to build a second hydro plant to increase the production of heavy water. Meanwhile, the SOE were stepping up their efforts to find a way to sabotage Vimork. They acquired contacts inside the plant who leaked all sorts of info, but actually sabotaging the plant was another matter. Any attempt by workers to destroy or pollute the heavy water carried the death sentence. So the SOE began recruiting and training a specialist force. These were mostly men from the Norwegian Special Forces or the Norwegian Army, already with experience skiing, handling explosives, and survival in winter conditions. At a school in the north of Scotland where the terrain was similar to Telemark, marksmanship, espionage, map reading, close combat, camouflage, and advanced survival techniques were taught to the recruits. But the Germans were on high alert, repeated attacks all over Norway, sabotaging railway lines and industrial plants had made them nervous. The hydro plant was now guarded by electrified barbed wire, dogs, searchlights, and hidden machine gun posts. Well. By October 1942, a vanguard of commandos parachuted onto the Hardanger Plateau, close to the lakes where the hydro plant got its water. They were to make contact with the resistance and find potential landing places for gliders. On November 19th, Operation Freshman was put into action. Two airspeed Horsa gliders pulled by Handley Page Halifax bombers made for Norway, with British paratroopers and Royal Engineers aboard. As they approached the landing area, heavy fog descended on the mountains. One of the bombers misjudged its height and smashed into the mountainside, while the glider crashed on the ground. The second glider missed the actual landing zone and crashed near the first plane. It was a disaster, and the few survivors in such a remote location were unable to continue the mission. All they could do was wait for the SS to appear, and the Germans had issued the commando order. Every man identified as a commando was to be interrogated and then shot. No prisoners were taken. Amid visions of V-2 rockets armed with nuclear warheads falling on London, the SOE hastily agreed to send in the Norwegian Special Forces in Operation Gunnerside. They would parachute onto the Hardanger Plateau and ski their way to the hydro plant to destroy the heavy water stock or the electrolytic equipment in the basement. On February 16, 1943, a British Halifax flying under German radar crossed into Norway. The men successfully parachuted down, and in white camouflage, they skied toward the plant. Now, Vimork had been under lockdown since the failed Operation Freshman. German intelligence had been sweeping the countryside for potential collaborators, and additional patrols, floodlights, and anti-aircraft guns were now deployed. The direct way in, the single bridge crossing a ravine, was out of the question. There was, though, a potential weakness a railway line that brought equipment into the plant. The train passed through a gate in the fence, and because of its prohibitive location, was presumably only lightly guarded. They were also tipped that there was a secret entrance to the basement through an open cable duct. On the night of the 28th, the commandos descended the ravine, crossed the icy river, and climbed the other side in the harsh wind of Norwegian winter, reaching the railway line undetected. There was only a pair of guards and enough cover to sneak by, the gate just a few hundred meters away. They split into two groups. One was the demolition team. The other would cover its advance with submachine guns and grenades if the guards were alerted. With bolt cutters, they opened their way into the compound. While the demolition group made their way to the electrolytic capacitors in the basement, the other team took positions to engage the enemy, aiming their guns at the nearby barracks. The basement door was locked, but as promised, the cable duct was still open. Two commandos from the demolition team crawled inside and through the tight space. After 10 minutes of crawling, they reached a hole over the basement 
and lowered themselves down. They quickly overwhelmed the surprised workers and locked the door. In the room with the capacitors, they planted 20 nitrocellulose charges around the equipment and ignited the fuses. They then released the workers and all dashed out through the door. The explosion that rocked the basement set fire to the building, but the heavy concrete had muffled the sound and no alarm was raised. Running through the night, they linked up with the second team and made for the railway lines. As they reached the ravine, a shrill siren sound came from the compound, but luckily for the saboteurs, the floodlights could not catch them. They disappeared into the night. The raid was a success, and the commandos dispersed. Alone or in small groups, they had a better chance to escape the German pursuers, and their individual escape stories are just as interesting as this story. Some hid in plain sight among the civilian population. Others made their way to Sweden. One guy named Helberg had to escape James Bond style from a German ski patrol that chased him down a mountain while he fired at them with his pistol. All in all, the sabotage was one of the most impressive feats of the whole war, straight out of an Alistair MacLean novel. And though it did not put a stop to the German heavy water program, it did put them behind schedule. In November, the British conducted a bombing raid on Vimork that did little damage to the machinery, but that, together with the commando raid, convinced the Germans to relocate their heavy water to Germany. Norwegian spies got the time and the place of the transport, though, and on February 20th, 1944, the ferry, with the fitting name Hydro, was sunk by Norwegian saboteurs, and nearly all of the heavy water was forever lost to the Germans in the depths of Lake Tin. At the end of the war, a second hydro plant in Bavaria was discovered. It had produced nearly enough heavy water for an atomic bomb. If the Norwegian heavy water had reached Germany in time, Hitler might have had nuclear weapons after all. So Par, tell us about the song, Saboteurs. The song is actually very old, even though it was uh, originally released on the 2010 album Code of Arms. Right. This song was one of the first ever written for Sabaton. Like from the 90s and stuff? Or... Mm, almost. But it, it wasn't uh, finished. So it was only some ideas of it. And I loved the song from mm. the beginning. It was uh, our singer Joachim who wrote it, but he didn't get the final pieces to glue together. Originally, the song was, of course, written before we even started to talk about the topic of war. Right. Okay. So it had a different So not name. saboteurs, no. No, it was not saboteurs, it was actually called Holy Lies. But so, if it was Holy Lies way back then, before the albums and stuff, do you have like a, a, like a demo version or a rough version of that? We, we, we did a short, super crappy uh, rehearsal recording of it, actually. And we can hear it? Yeah. Okay, uh, so let's hear it. Super crappy, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I thought that it fitted very well with the story about the hydro plant in Norway. And it, it connects to a funny thing. When we released the song, we were contacted by the Norsk Hydro, the, the... By the plant? Yeah, the, by the plant cool. and one of the representatives from it, who sent a little gift in shape of a little bottle containing water. Heavy water. No way. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough to produce a nuclear bomb, of course, but, okay. but if we ever want, we need a couple of more small bottles. <laughs> you got a li little heavy water. <laughs> we were also asked by the people from Norsk Kino to do, actually do a concert in their hydro plant. Wow. So this was something we, uh, we couldn't do at the time, in 2010, but we have still oh. talked about it, and there is an option to do it in the future. But if you did, you know, since I live in Stockholm, I would totally come for that. Could I introduce you? Sure. That'd be fun. <laughs> I mean, okay. I, my idea. We'll see if it ever works out. The song Saboteurs mm -hmm. has also inspired to another thing. What? It inspired to the German fan club. Right. They are right. called the German Saboteurs. Why, why do you suppose they chose that? Well, I think that they refer to that they want to come and sabotage our concerts, I guess. Aha. Uh -huh. Wait. <laughs> 
even though I don't think that they sabotage our concert, I think that no. they make them very rich. <laughs> now, uh, the, your other different national fan clubs and stuff, do they all have different names based on songs and stuff? Some of them have. I mean, we, we do have fan clubs who are named after Wolfpack, and uh, we have uh, Panzer Battalions and, this, uh, and Karelians. Are the so. Brazilians ones like Smoking Snakes? Of course. Of course. <laughs> So that was the story about saboteurs. But we'll see you next time on Sabaton History. All right, thanks for watching. And don't forget to subscribe to the Sabaton History channel. Check out the Indies other channels. And also support us on Patreon because that's really what makes this happen.